So we know we have two different types of bone tissue. We have compact bone and spongy bone. So let's discuss the structure of compact bone. The osteon, also referred to as the Herbergian system, is the basic unit of a compact bone. So what makes up the osteon are these concentric lamellae, something that I've illustrated to the right. And going around these concentric lamellae are the osteocytes in a lacuna. So these concentric lamellae will form the osteon. Incidentally, if we're looking at one ring, that's referred to as a concentric lamella. If we're looking at two or more rings, then that's a concentric lamellae. So right at the very center of the osteon is the central canal. So what I've done in my illustration is I've taken the central canal and enlarged it. So we can look at what we find in the central canal. Well, it turns out what we find in the central canal, right at the very center of the osteon, is an artery and a vein. So the artery is carrying oxygen-rich blood, while the vein is carrying carbon dioxide-rich blood. So it turns out that the artery that carries the high oxygen, that oxygen will diffuse out of that artery, and it will then go to the osteocytes. And these osteocytes are arranged going around these concentric lamellae. So just so we understand my picture, these orange dots that I illustrated in my drawing, those are the osteocytes in a lacuna. And the fine blue lines are the canaliculi. So central canal, we have our artery, we have our vein. So the oxygen leaves the artery and diffuses to the osteocytes that are in the lacuna. Now the fact that these osteocytes have these cytoplasmic extensions and the fact that they're communicating and in touch with other osteocytes via the gap junctions, it allows the oxygen and nutrients to spread across the osteocytes. And of course, we also learn that these cytoplasmic extensions go through these canaliculi. Now these osteocytes will produce carbon dioxide. So that carbon dioxide produced by these osteocytes will end up going into the vein. This is why I say that the canaliculi are the lifeline of these osteocytes. This is the only way that these osteocytes are going to get the oxygen and nutrients that they require. Now in the central canal, we find the artery and the vein, as I just mentioned, and as well as a nerve. I did not include the nerve in the illustration of the central canal. Now there's another canal referred to as the perforating canal, also called the Volksmann's canal. And these Volksmann's canal, or perforating canal, will also carry blood vessels and nerve into the bone. Now these perforating canals are perpendicular to the central canal. If we look at my drawing down below over here, what I've illustrated are two osteons. So you can see the central canal run parallel to the osteons, that means they run in the same direction, while the perforating canal run perpendicular to the central canal, or perpendicular to the osteons. Now we have different types of lamellae. We have the concentric lamellae, which form the osteons, which we just looked at, and of course we know it contains a central canal, where we have our artery, our vein, and a nerve. We also have another type of lamellae that we find in compact bone, and that's called the circumferential lamellae. So these circumferential lamellae are found in the outer and the inner bone surfaces. Because of that, we have what's called the outer or external circumferential lamellae and the inner or internal circumferential lamellae. So the outer or external circumferential lamellae are found at the outer bone surface, while the inner or internal circumferential lamellae are found in the inner bone surface. Now, these circumferential lamellae are covered by either the periosteum or the endosteum. So if we look at the outer external circumferential lamellae, you can see the periosteum which is the area that I'm highlighting in blue. So deep to the periosteum lies this outer or external circumferential lamellae. Now, if we look at the internal or inner circumferential lamellae, it is covered by the endosteum. And we learned that the endosteum is what 
lines the internal surfaces of bone. And of course, the inner or internal circumferential lamellae is found in the inner bone surface. The last type of lamellae are the interstitial lamellae. And these interstitial lamellae fill in spaces between the osseons. And they represent remnants of almost completely recycled osseons. So in other words, these are the old lamellae. So if we go back to this image, we have the green areas as the outer and inner circumferential lamellae. The blue areas that I shaded in represents the interstitial lamellae. So if you look carefully, you can see that the interstitial lamellae are sandwiched or are between the osseon. And of course, the concentric lamellae is what gives us the osteon with a centrally located central canal. So before we move on to the next slide, I just want to quickly talk about these osteons and the compact bone. So I'm just going to quickly make an illustration of a long bone, and we're going to focus on the diaphysis, uh, the shaft of the long bone that we know is made up of compact bone. Now, it turns out that these osteons all run along the same direction. They're as long as the diaphysis. What I'm illustrating are the osteons all going in the same direction. This is what's going to allow the bone to handle the vertical compression forces that's applied to the bone. So a good analogy of this is imagine that you have a bunch of straws. And you take these straws and you somehow bind them together. I don't know, maybe with scotch tape. So they're all bundled together and they're perfectly lined up. Then you lay the bundle of straws flat on a table. If you were to put a book over the bundle of straws, as long as it's perfectly level, it can handle the weight of that book. Now, what the osteons and what these straws cannot handle are strong horizontal forces, forces that are coming in this direction. So if we have forces that are going in this direction horizontally being applied to the osseons, then you can cause these osseons to break. In other words, we can end up with a fractured bone. Just like if we were to take a karate chop to the straws, then we can possibly bend the straws. So these are seen, for example, in athletes such as NFL players where they're subjected to the horizontal forces being applied to their bones. So it's not uncommon for them to fracture their bones. So this image allows us to review the structures that we looked at the previous slide. So we talked about that we have three different types of lamellae. We have the outer circumferential lamellae, which we can also refer to as external circumferential lamellae. And the periosteum is what will cover the outer or external circumferential lamellae. And the inner circumferential lamellae, which I highlighted in green as well, which is also referred to as the internal circumferential lamellae. So it's lined by the endosteum. Since it's not labeled, let's go ahead and use a blue highlighter to highlight that area where we have the endosteum. So the endosteum will cover the inner or internal circumferential lamellae. We can also see the concentric lamellae which will form the one osteon. And right in the middle, of course, is the central canal where we find the artery, the vein, and as well as a nerve. And sandwiched in between the osteons are the third type of lamellae, the interstitial lamellae that I highlighted in blue. So these are found between the osteons. We also mentioned that at the center of the osteon, are these central canal, and these central canals run parallel to the osteons. And we also have another canal, the perforating canal, that runs perpendicular to the osteons. The last thing I want to mention or discuss are these osteocytes in the lacuna with the radiating canaliculi where we find their cytoplasmic extensions. So please be aware that regardless of the type of lamellae that we are looking at, if you look closely enough, you're going to see these osteocytes. You're going to see them throughout this layer of compact bone. 
So you find the osteocytes in their lacuna, and these fine lines are these canaliculi. So the second type of bone tissue that we have is spongy bone. Spongy bone is sometimes referred to as trabecular bone or cancellous bone. So let's look at the structure of spongy bone. Spongy bone do not have osteons. Therefore, there is no such thing as concentric lamellae, because after all, the concentric lamellae is what forms the osteon. What we have instead is that the bony matrix forms a mesh of supporting thin columns. In other words, what we have instead are these bony struts, as you can see with the images down below. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight these bony struts. And these bony struts, these column shape bony struts, are referred to as trabeculi. So if we're looking at several of them, which I'm highlighting right now in blue, then we refer to it as a trabeculi. If we're looking at one bony strut or one column shape strut, then that's called a trabecula. Please note that the trabeculi is covered or lined with the endosteum. Trabeculi do not have central canals or perforating canals that we find again in compact bone. Spongy bone is located where bones are not heavily stressed, but where stresses come from many different directions. This is something we're going to look at later in a slide that talks about what's called the lines of stress. Spongy bone is lighter than compact bone. Hopefully you can see why that is, because what we have in spongy bone is a lot of open spaces. And these spaces that we find between the trabeculae is either filled with red bone marrow or yellow bone marrow. If it is filled with red bone marrow, what we have in those spaces is an area or spaces that's filled with blood. As mentioned before, red bone marrow is the site of where we form our blood cells through a process called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. Now, these open spaces between the trabeculae can also be yellow bone marrow. So why is it referred to as yellow? Because yellow means it's storing adipose, it's storing lipids, it's storing fat. So if we look at the images down below, here is a cross-section of one of the trabecula. So if you notice, we will still have the lamellae. However, we do not call these lamellae concentric lamellae. Because if you say concentric lamellae, then that means you're implying that you have an osteon. And of course, no such osteons exist in spongy bone. Osteons, again, are only found in compact bone. So we still use the word lamellae, but we don't use the word concentric lamellae. And if you look close enough, there is no central canal. So what we have in the lamellae is still your osteocyte in a lacuna. And of course, with the radiating canaliculi. And here's another image of a cross section of a trabecula. And take note, we have lamellae here, but it's not labeled as concentric lamellae. Of course, the osteocyte in a lacuna with the radiating canaliculi. Also take note in the images that the surface of these trabeculi is covered with the endosteum. So I went ahead and highlighted in a light blue color the endosteum. So in this image, here's the endosteum, and in this image, here's the endosteum. So please remember that the surface of the trabeculae are covered with the endosteum. And we'll look at the endosteum in more detail, as well as the periosteum, later. Now, I want to just show you this particular image. So what we have is that while we're young, as a newborn, as a child, even as an adolescent, most of the spongy bone will contain red bone marrow. But as we continue to age, what we have is the replacement of red bone marrow with yellow bone marrow. As you can see what happens when we start approaching our senior years. Most of the open spaces found between the trabeculae is now yellow bone marrow. Now, is it possible for yellow bone marrow to become red bone marrow? The answer is yes. So when the body needs blood cells, the yellow bone marrow can become red bone marrow and resume the process of hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. In other words, it can resume blood cell production.
So it turns out that the trabeculae, these bony struts that form spongy bone, the direction in which they form or they take is not random. They follow a particular direction based upon the forces that is being applied to that bone. So the direction that they take forms what's called lines of stress. And as you can see, these lines of stress go in different directions. And this is why spongy bone is built or designed to handle stresses that are coming from many different directions. And if you look at this particular diagram of an adult bone, you could see the lines of stress. You could see the direction in which these trabeculae take. It's not, once again, random. Now, when the child has not yet learned to walk, for example, an infant, if we look at the proximal epiphysis of their femur, which is what these images represent, the trabeculae is not yet formed, as you can see right over here, because they're not yet walking. Now, when they learn to walk, the trabeculae will then orient themselves to follow the stresses being applied to that bone. So this just shows us how dynamic our bones are. Our bone is living tissue. Now, as an adult, if we all of a sudden change the way that we walk, and we consistently walk that way for a long period of time, the trabeculae will reform. Because now, by changing the way you walk, new stresses or different direction of stresses is now being applied. So once again, this just shows us how dynamic our bones are. So let's now talk about the periosteum and the endosteum. So the periosteum is the external membrane or external covering. And as been mentioned several times over, this covers all external bone surfaces except parts enclosed in a joint capsule and at the articular cartilage. So we'll see this later on when we get to the joint chapter. This periosteum consists of two layers. So we have the outer fibrous layer and we have the inner cellular layer, which is also referred to as the osteogenic layer. Now, what we find in this inner cellular layer or osteogenic layer are three of the bone cells, the osteoblasts, the osteoprogenitor cells, and the osteoclasts. What we do not have are the osteocytes. The reason being is because the osteocytes are in a lacuna with the radiating canaliculi. We do not find this in the inner cellular layer of the periosteum. Now, what will anchor the periosteum to the external surface of bone are what we call perforating fibers, also called Sharpie's fibers. And these are thick bundles of collagen fibers of the periosteum. So this will secure the periosteum to the underlying bone. So let's now look at some of the images that we find in this slide. So here is the periosteum. We have the outer fibrous layer that I highlighted in yellow and the inner cellular or osteogenic layer that I highlighted in blue. So take note that the periosteum is covering the outer circumferential lamellae. Now, where are these Sharpie's fibers? So if you look really close, you could see them. So these things that are sort of like needle-like structures, those are the perforating fibers. This is what's going to anchor the periosteum to the external surface of bone. And as a result, the periosteum does not come off easily. It doesn't just slide off the bone. So if you've ever eaten ribs, and you want to get every single last morsel of meat off the rib, chances are you're ripping the periosteum off of the bone. And that takes some effort. It doesn't just come off easily. Here's another image of the periosteum with the outer fibrous layer and the inner cellular layer. And you can also see the perforating fibers that secures the periosteum to the external surface of bone. So what are the functions of the periosteum? Well, they isolate bone from the surrounding tissue. They provide a route for blood vessels and nerve to enter and leave the bone. And you can see this down over here, right? So here is the periosteum and here are your arteries and here are your veins. 
and here are the nerves. So this provides once again a route for blood vessels and nerve to enter and leave the bone. The periosteum also will participate in bone growth, fracture repair, and bone remodeling. And these will be discussed later. They also serve as an attachment point for ligaments and tendons, something we'll discuss later on as well. So the endosteum is the internal covering or internal membrane, and it consists of only one layer. So this is different from the periosteum, which consists of two layers. We have our osteoblasts, our osteoprogenitor cells, and our osteoclasts. So we refer to these bone cells that make up the endosteum as the endosteal cells. So as we've mentioned many times over, it lines the internal surfaces of bone, such as the medullary cavity, such as the trabeculae of spongy bone, as well as the inner surfaces of the central canals and the perforating canals. And these are canals that passes through the compact bone. So what is the function of the endosteum? Well, it participates in bone growth, fracture repair, and bone remodeling, just like one of the functions of the periosteum. So we have two images here and here that shows us the endosteum. So once again, these endosteal cells that make up the single layer of the endosteum consist of the osteoclast, the osteoblast, and the osteoprogenitor cells. We do not find the osteocytes in the endosteum because once again, the osteocytes are enclosed in a lacuna with the radiating canaliculi. And of course, the osteocytes are surrounded by bone. 